Good morning. Before we begin, I want to apologize for the lack of an ALS interpreter uh, today. Unfortunately, there was no one available, but we expect there will be again on Wednesday. So again, my, my apologies for that. Over the last few weeks, we've taken a couple of small steps to reopen our economy and put people back to work. Each week, we've seen the situation improve because of Vermonters' sacrifices and their work to stay separated, which slowed the spread of the virus. As a result, we've avoided the worst possible outcomes and saved hundreds of lives. So as we continue to see these positive trends, we can also keep slowly turning the spigot. Restarting Vermont must be a phased approach, and so as to make sure we're not moving too quickly and putting our families, friends, and neighbors at risk. Our approach must also be strategic and creative because even while we put more people to work, it's anything but business as usual. I want to take a moment to highlight one sector that I believe set a great example of how this can be done. As you know, this weekend, our farmers markets reopened, but through an agreed upon set of guidelines, they did so in a way that kept people separated and focused on food distribution. Secretary Tebbets will update you in a few minutes, but from what I saw myself and heard, uh, they took this seriously and put public health first in a way that is a great example for others. On Friday, I also mentioned the possibility of taking steps forward on outdoor recreation this week. And our farmer's markets may be a model for the how in this strange new world. Last week, we also announced our strategy for increased testing and contact tracing, which is essential to any restart strategy. So as we find an outbreak, that's like a brush fire, we're able to put it out before an out of control forest fire erupts. This strategy is especially important as we look to erase or ease some of the restrictions on healthcare procedures. So today we'll announce some initial steps to allow for some procedures to begin again. It's important to know that our testing and tracing program is a critical part of this plan. While the initial restrictions were necessary, we also know that procedures put on hold are important to overall health. So we thank everyone for their patience uh, as we made uh, sure we didn't risk the ability to care for COVID-19 patients. Today, after working on a restart plan with the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems, the Vermont Medical Society, the Bi-State Primary Care Association, and Health First, we feel it's safe to resume more healthcare services in Vermont. In a joint effort with my team, they've developed guidelines to outline to allow outpatient services and clinic visits, things like diagnostic imaging and some outpatient surgeries and procedures. To be clear, elective surgeries that require a hospital stay are not part of this phase. But if things continue to improve with respect to PPE inventory, uh, and if our positive trends continue, then we'll look to open up a bit further and allow elective surgeries that require a hospital stay, like hip surgery and knee surgeries. So again, I want to thank Vermonters for all you've done to get us to this point, and those on the front lines for their service and care for the people of Vermont. I also want to remind everyone that I expect we'll be making a few other announcements this week that go beyond just business openings uh, to address some of our social needs as well. So with that, I'll now ask Dr. Levine to share more details about the many safety precautions of this first healthcare phase. Dr. Levine. <clears throat> Thank you, Governor Scott. Ensuring we have the proper precautions and can closely monitor this phased restart will be key to our ability to move forward. As you just all heard, a great deal of planning and input has been provided to us across many Vermont and national professional societies and organizations as we sought ways to effectively and safely put these proper steps in place. First, with respect to outpatient clinic visits and diagnostic imaging, such as mammography, facilities and healthcare professionals 
must demonstrate they're adhering to social distancing and relevant CDC guidelines regarding infection control and prevention to maintain a safe environment for patients and staff. Examples of the precautions that should be taken when providing care in both the facility and clinic settings include, but aren't limited to, some of these following examples. A process to screen patients for COVID-19 related symptoms prior to any scheduled procedure. A process to screen staff and essential visitors for symptoms prior to entering a facility. PPE should be worn and utilized as necessary to ensure state staff and patient safety. This may require surgical N95, KN95, or other equivalent masks and eye protection goggles. Patients and companions must wear mouth and nose coverings when in public areas. Companions are permitted only if required for direct patient assistance. Only individuals who are essential to conducting the surgery or procedure should be in the surgery or procedure suite or other patient care areas where PPE is required. Obviously, waiting room chairs must be distanced at six feet. There must be written procedures for disinfection of all common areas and signage to emphasize the social restrictions, such as distancing, cough etiquette, wearing of coverings, etc. There should be liberal access to hand sanitizer and compliance with guidance issued by relevant professional specialty societies regarding appropriate prioritization of procedures and care issues specific to COVID-19. And in light of the fact we've had so many recent successes with telemedicine and telephone medicine, these should consider to be considered when appropriate and policies and procedures reassessed and reevaluated frequently based on COVID-19 related data, resources, testing, and other clinic information. Next, for outpatient surgeries and procedures that have a minimal impact on inpatient hospital bed capacity and PPE levels, including those performed in the office or ambulatory surgery center setting, everything I've just said remains true, and these facilities need to put into place the following additional precautionary measures. Screening obviously for COVID-19 related symptoms prior to all procedures by phone, online, or in person. Testing is required for procedures requiring airway management and should be done as close as possible to the procedure, not to exceed 96 hours prior. Patients will be required to self-quarantine between testing and procedure. Testing of healthcare employees. All facilities will need to develop a plan and implement that plan for the periodic testing of all healthcare workers. For example, nurses, physicians, emergency medical personnel, students, laboratory technicians, pharmacists, and others. These plans should be coordinated with the Vermont Testing Task Force, which we've just set up last week. Available PPE with each clinic responsible to ensure has, it has adequate supplies of PPE through its own suppliers for needed examinations or procedures, and in the case of a COVID-19 surge, and not need to rely on state sources or state supply chain for PPE. And finally, test results should be communicated to the patient prior to their arrival to the facility for the outpatient surgery. While these guidelines will allow, allow these services to resume in the safest manner possible today, we must acknowledge that circumstances may change and that these services may need to be suspended again in the future if the Department of Health determines that a COVID-19 outbreak has occurred and healthcare professionals can no longer safely care for Vermonters in a way that limits the exposure of patients and staff and that preserves PPE, ventilators, and inpatient hospital capacity to meet the needs of an outbreak. Depending on the severity of outbreak, we must acknowledge that the Department of Health may require a return to the standards of care set out in the governor's executive order of March 20th, with the suspension of all non-essential adult elective surgery and medical and surgical procedures. 
In addition, on the more optimistic side, though, if our efforts to slow and contain the spread of the virus continue to succeed, we expect to slowly and safely reopen other parts of our healthcare system, such as dentistry and eye care. As promised, uh, I believe we're going to have on video uh, Secretary Tebbets next. Thank you, Dr. Levine, and uh, thank you to our, our farmers and our producers across Vermont who are working hard to feed us. Vermont agriculture is open. The cows, the goats, the sheep are being milked, the cheese is being made, the greens are being grown, and our meat plants are busy processing beef, chicken, turkey, pork, and lamb. Thank you uh, to all the Vermonters who love our local food and the people who provide our farmers with market channels to reach our consumers. As the governor mentioned this weekend, farmers markets did open for their outdoor season. They did a great job in this new world. Markets have transformed themselves in a small amount of time, never letting up their mission to provide local food to shoppers. In some respects, uh, the markets are gonna look different than they used to. Uh, we have hit pause on some of the social aspects of farmers market. Uh, shoppers are picking up their orders and completing their trips without samples. The greetings and the music, uh, those are gonna have to wait until another time. But you will find, continue to find, fresh Vermont products from our farmers and producers. You will notice new guidelines aimed at uh, keeping farmers and our shoppers safe. You'll find more spacing between the vendors, more space between shoppers, and you'll find all people wearing masks, and many shoppers are pre-ordering their products online. Following these new guidelines, we'll have more markets opening up this month and many more in the month of June. This model, which was developed by farmers and the markets and consumers, could be a blueprint for others as they navigate this new approach to organizing events and gatherings. Uh, the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets stands ready to help others. Helping has been the theme for so many across Vermont during this pandemic. So many are sacrificing to help us get through this. We thank our farmers for leading and sacrificing. We know the future is uncertain, but we know one thing is certain. Our farmers wake up every day committed to working hard and being the best. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Tebbets. And uh, as an aside, when I came in on Saturday uh, to come into the office, I did go by the farmer's market here in Montpelier. And, I was uh, very impressed uh, with what I saw and what they were doing and how they were conducting themselves. So uh, tip of the hat to them uh, for doing the right thing and being a model for others. Um, I know we have a number of people on the line. I think it's a record today. I think there's 26 uh, reporters calling in, so we probably should get right to it. Uh, yes, sir. So um, I think I caught all the questions. It was, it was kind of quiet. Um, but uh, in I think, uh, Commissioner the, Harrington, I, th I think the question, the question was, uh, how many people do we have answering phones at this point in time? Uh, we have approximately 175. Uh, that's 100 uh, through the vendor, uh, Maximus, and another 75 um, uh, through our partnership uh, with others. Um, we Maximus this is on a path to reach uh, 200 uh, over the next seven to 10 days. Um, but I will say also, we are seeing a number of lines that actually are seeing downtime with the line. So uh, both uh, at our GNP call center and on the Maximus line, we are finding that there are points throughout the day or throughout the week um, where the, the queue uh, might have calls in it, but the queue is not maxed out and there aren't um, people being bounced off the line, which is good news. Um, we do see um, some high points throughout the day and throughout the week, uh, and certain lines are busier than others, depending on the need at that moment. Um, uh, with that, I'll also say that we, we are finding that a number of the issues we're resolving now, um, there are, again, these cohorts of people that um, either need a claim adjudicated, which is going through the process, or there um, is some other aspect to their claim. But we're also finding that there are uh, large portions of the population 
um, who have also have an open file or an open claim in our system, but are simply just not filing their weekly claims. Um, we're working to reach out to them to make sure that that is um, not a, a misconception on their part um, and that they are truly not seeking um, benefits, but um, there's there's kind of these different pockets of groups we're trying to reach out to. Um, another group out there that uh, has has called a number of times has been um, really people who have uh, uh, incidentally or accidentally filled out their PUA application in an incorrect method or form um, and now need to make adjustments to that form. So we're also working on ways to improve the service there as well. Um, but in terms of traffic on the phone lines, at one point I think we reported hundreds of thousands of calls coming into lines. Uh, now we're reporting um, tens of thousands, if not, uh, like I said, um, you know, hundreds or thousands at any at any given time. So we are seeing uh, a trend there, if you will. And um, if people keep falling through the cracks, Bill, this might be more of a question for you. Would you consider cutting a second round of twelve hundred dollar checks? Yeah, as I said last week, uh, that was a consideration, but I was convinced that many of those were. Uh, bigger issues. Uh, some of those who were left were bigger issues that uh, um, could um, be that they weren't entitled to a, a check at this point in time. Maybe it was child support payments that weren't being paid or something of that nature. So uh, we decided to wait again this week, see if they can clear up some more of the backlog. But I'm prepared uh, to, again, uh, release another round of checks if necessary. Stewart. Governor, a question about PPP, um, particularly uh, hospitality and tourism. Some businesses are concerned about some of the red tape with respect to loan forgiveness, and I'm wondering, given the uncertainty of the timeline, when some of those folks might be able to reopen. Is there? Are you? Have you heard of complaints uh, about so the restrictions that come with PPP, and what what is your guidance to, to some who are just weary about? Yeah, it? yeah, you know, it's a very real problem um, that they're facing because they don't know when they're going to open, and there's uh, restrictions, uh, limitations on how long uh, before they have to reopen, uh, in order to uh, receive the money as a grant. So. I'm very aware of the problem. Our Restart Vermont team is very uh, aware of the problem. In fact, we have uh, a couple of people from uh, the, the industry, uh, the restaurant and bar uh, community uh, that are on the committee. So we know about it. Uh, we're trying to figure out what to do about it as well um, so that they can utilize that form uh, to get the relief they need. I know uh, the congressional delegation is also aware of this. Uh, because what, what the, the best uh, thing, I think, approach at this point would be for Congress uh, to extend that uh, for a few more weeks. That would, uh, that would certainly be uh, helpful. I think when they first went into this, everyone thought maybe eight weeks was enough um, because they sh we should be out of this by then. But as we're seeing, uh, we are uh, far from out of the woods on this. So I think uh, Congress uh, taking some action would help. But we are also considering uh, trying to find creative ways for us to help as well. So we'll uh, stay tuned on that. Uh, it's a very real issue, and uh, we want to do everything we can to help them because it's a vital part of our, our uh, economy here in Vermont. Uh, Governor, the, uh, at the end of this uh, week last week, the Senate came up with their bill, and they've got it on the floor. They passed it. Um, your thoughts on that, and I, I know you've, uh, you're kind of wondering where the money's coming from, but also the definitions of who can get it. And yeah, it, you know, it's uh, interesting. Again, I don't, uh, the concept I think is very noble. Uh, I like the idea of trying to, to help those uh, in need. Um, but my question always goes back to, uh, you know, how, who, where's the money going to come from? Uh, if it can't come out of the um, CARES Act money, uh, which we don't believe that it does, but you know, if we, if we can get it, uh, fine. Um, but, uh, but where do we get it then? Uh, we have a $400 million hole in the budget uh, predicted uh, for next year at this point in time. And uh, we have a bit of a hole in uh, fiscal year 20, which we're not out of yet. So um, again, Noble Cause uh, want to help, uh, but, uh, but it really gets down to what are the strings attached to the CARE money uh, that 
maybe some aren't considering. And, and I, I think we should look at this as uh, this isn't general fund money that just comes in the door and, and, and the legislature gets to decide how, how we spend it. It's really uh, money that has strings attached like Medicaid money or transportation uh, fund money from the federal government and it has strings attached to it. So we just have to be uh, very aware of that and if we want to move forward um, then let's consider what source uh, the money will come from if this doesn't uh, work out. Because I don't want to get people's hopes up either if this isn't going to work. Well, the, uh, as a follow-up, uh, you were saying your administration has been talking with them and, and discussing how to go about this thing. Uh, is it just that they're not listening to you, do you think? No, I mean, no, I think they, they read it differently than maybe we do. Um, and again, if we're wrong on this and it can be taken, that's, that's a different story. Um, but my other, um, my other concern is that we need to see the magnitude of the problem. You know, we're looking at this myopically with one sector. We're looking at this from a, a hazard pay. Those who have been working uh, want to give them some extra money uh, because of all their actions. But we don't know. I mean, we've seen it with our state colleges. We see it with our education system, public education, the education fund, uh, transportation fund. We see uh, the, the agriculture community is uh, on the brink uh, of, uh, of really collapsing in a lot of different ways. Uh, we, uh, we need to focus on what is the magnitude of the problem? What can we do with the money? And how can we disperse it in a way that is truly meaningful and will help us out of this in the long run? If we start spending the money too soon on, on uh, things that, uh, uh, that uh, we're not sure whether we, we, can, uh, we can legitimately use the money for, it leaves less money for us to do uh, with elsewhere uh, at the end of this. So again, uh, it goes to the House. I'm sure that they'll take testimony on this, and maybe we'll find out in between this time whether that's a, a legitimate uh, source of, of the money from the CARES Act. All right, we're going to move to the phones now, beginning with Kat from WCAX. Good morning. Governor, on Friday, you announced that tens of thousands more Vermonters would be get to go back to work on May 11th when the industries like construction and manufacturing open up fully. Over the weekend, we heard from some people who are really excited to go back to work and stop collecting unemployment, but they're worried that they won't be able to do that because they have children and no school or child care options. So for them, what is your plan of addressing child care issues, both for the kids who are school age, but also the kids who are younger? as we reopen the economy. Yeah, I, I believe that the uh, Congress had put some exceptions in the, uh, in the unemployment uh, oversight uh, that if they did have to, if they didn't have childcare, they would not have to go back to work. Uh, so I wanna make sure that's out there. Uh, simultaneously, we're working with our Restart Vermont folks on trying to contemplate uh, childcare because it becomes a very real issue as we open up more sectors. So. Uh, again, it's on our radar. We're trying to do all we can, but my message would be to those who simply don't have childcare and are asking me to go back to work or asked to, be, to go back to work, uh, that they don't have to if they, uh, if they can uh, show that, uh, that childcare is an issue for them. Uh, Commissioner Harrington, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, thank you, Governor. Just that our state uh, statute was also amended um, to ensure that if someone has to stay home uh, to care for a loved one or a child, um, that they would be eligible for unemployment insurance benefits. So just to be very clear here, can employers fire employees who don't return because they have child care conflicts? I think the statute is uh, pretty clear on that, uh, Kat, uh, that they cannot. Um, but uh, and, and I believe there's some language in the congressional act as well. So I would say no. Mr. Harrington, am I correct on that? Uh, I'll, I will um, have to say we'll review it in more detail and, and get back to you. Um, again, I just want to make sure I'm uh, referencing the right parts of the section um, for protection for employees. Got it. This the follow up uh, last follow up I had on the child care issue is for Mike Smith. Um, are we still looking at like the June ish time frame that you referenced a few press conferences ago for child care? Thanks, Kat, for the question. Mike Smith, Secretary of Human Services. Yeah, we what we at the earliest we're looking at the June 
um, the June 1st sort of date as we plan for child care to come come back online. So at the earliest, it would be June, uh, the June 1st uh, planning deadline that we're sort of putting into place. So we're still looking at that. All right, thank you. Brittany, Local 22. Hi, um, so just a quick question about reopening uh, Vermont. You said that farmers markets um, were, showed, were a great model this weekend. Uh, for other outdoor recreation that could possibly open. I was just wondering if you could give maybe any insight into, you know, what what you're looking to reopen next or what you're considering um, and maybe when we can expect that announcement. Yeah, again, um, sometime this week we'll be making the announcement and it's more about the how uh, rather than which sectors and, and trying to uh, determine, you know, across the board, what can we do uh, to provide for relief in the recreation areas uh, where we can have more of the social separation uh, that we don't put people at harm uh, that they were wearing masks where they were just putting all types of precautions into place uh, and guidelines as we as we do this so I would say uh, you know it's either going to be Wednesday or Friday uh, but I would uh, prefer to do it Wednesday if we can thank you Wilson Ring, AP. Um, hi, everybody. Happy Monday. Um, thinking about contact tracing, obviously, I well, I should say presumably, this has been going on to some extent from the very beginning. But when you're thinking about the increased testing and tracing that you were started talking about a week or so ago, has that kicked into, into gear yet? I mean, is that taking place? And if so, do you have any examples of where you think... Uh, quick tracing and testing might have stamped out a, you know, a super spreader incident? And if so, can you provide any details about that? Uh, Commissioner Levine, I think we have an example maybe today. <clears throat> so we continue to have a very, very low percent positive test rate. So you're not going to see the contact tracing at the level that uh, we have the workforce to provide, mainly because um, the number of cases that have been identified wouldn't warrant that completely. Um, but one instance uh, that has been very successful so far to our knowledge uh, is at our correctional facility where um, we have been doing repeated testing and it was through intense epidemiologic and contact tracing work there that we were able to really keep things very isolated in that facility. And there does not appear at this point in time to have been any spread beyond those uh, early uh, cases that we've had. Secretary Smith may have another one he doesn't mind. Wilson, uh, thank you for the question. We are going to be ramping up substantially uh, during this week and next, as um, as the commissioner had talked about last week. Our testing and tracing uh, programs, you'll start seeing the ramp up as uh, as it as it uh, moves on. Probably our greatest success is our ability to sort of um, look at a facility and and the commissioner. Commissioner Levine had talked about corrections, for example, the ability to trace, knowing where those early cases in the correctional facility came from, isolate those particular uh, inmates that may have come into contact and not allow the spread throughout the facility. But there's also other cases as well. I mean, we've, we've had a, a homeless, one homeless um, case in um, in Addison County that uh, we are tracking right now and tracing right now to make sure there's no spread there as well. So um, it is up and going. It's going to be considerably enhanced in the next week, week and a half as we move forward. But um, the tracing in in the correctional facility was something that was, I, I guess I would hail it as a success in keeping um, facility widespread to a minimum once we found those initial cases. So there's there's an example. Okay, thank you. 
Mike Donahue, the Islander. Mike, are you there? <clears throat> All right, we're going to move to Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. I think this is for uh, Lindsay Curley. Um, following on uh, Stuart's question about the PPP, there's a lot of uh, concern amongst businesses whether they're going to have to give some of this money back. And there's two different programs, as you know, the PPP itself and the EIDL. <clears throat> and most of the initial money came in from the grant from the EIDL. And now there is a suggestion that um, that might be subtracted from the PPP. And now on top of that is that the SBA sent out notices last week to some businesses anyway that the EIDL uh, loan money might be also coming in. So I'm wondering uh, what, what you're telling businesses that have these different loan programs going on. There's some tax issues in which uh, both Congress and the IRS are at uh, opposite ends of that needs also to be worked out. So what, what uh, should we be telling um, businesses, Lindsay, about should they be escrowing some of this money? Should they be concerned about maybe getting a clawback from the IRS or the federal government on all this? So, yes, I mean, I know that, you know, they put these programs out with, uh, you know, virtually overnight, and there was not a lot of guidance from the start. And as the guidance unroll, unraveled, um, some of the expectations changed and the guidance changed. So I would just say to people, I would continue to work with, if you have a financial advisor, a CPA, um, if you have a, a lender that you work with regularly, really stay in contact with them. They can help guide you on what you want to do to protect yourself in this case. I do know um, the governor mentioned earlier that the that Vermont's congressional delegation has worked really hard to encourage the Treasury to um, clarify and to arguably change some of the terms. So on, in the case of the PPP, the two-year um, loan payback is, is pretty rugged for folks who may not uh, have the majority of that loan forgiven because they maybe can't get their payroll, get the um, employees back in time. So you, you, somebody brought up the, the restaurants earlier and because, again, they don't know when they're going to be open, um, it's hard to say that they can get people back by the, the June date. So, um, again, I, I wouldn't discourage people from, from seeking this relief and this help but I would absolutely make sure that you have somebody to help guide you. And if, if you don't have a lender or a financial advisor that you work with regularly, uh, the governor put together a task force. And on, on one of the action teams, there are people with this expertise that are happy to lend um, like a concierge service and, and help folks navigate this. We've had a, a webinar already that was very successful and we intend to do more. But it is our goal to, to help people through this. And, um, but it, it is difficult. There are a lot of uncertainties. Uh, some people have received actually kind of substantial amounts of money, and so that that uh, begs the question of whether maybe they should just hold on to that instead of spending it. Do you have any guidance on that? Well, I think it really depends on the scenario. I've heard some success stories with these PPP loans as well for employers who are um, that, that maybe their their business volume was dropped for a bit but they were able to keep their employees um, through that downtime and they've been able to spend the money on the things that are forgivable and keep their payroll going so it's really hard to just give blanket advice on these things that there are so many different scenarios that could be going on so again i'm happy to to help people connect you know connect people with some experts that can walk them through their their options Okay. Th thank you, Lindsay. You bet. All right. And I believe uh, Mike Donahue is on now. Mike, the Islander. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure who this is for. Maybe the Commissioner of Health. Uh, I got this question sent to me from a fire rescue chief on Friday. Um, why is there a delay in notifying uh, EMS? when someone tested positive that they've interacted with. And currently many times it, it, 
the chief is saying they're not notified, and I'm just wondering how many departments have seen positive tests within their uh, first responders uh, since this started? What department? Mike, that's a very interesting question. I do not have data in front of me to help you understand how many uh, EMS departments have had positives. We can see if we have data on that in the health department, and I can get back to you with that. Do you have any idea why there's a delay in notifying them when, like, if they transport a prison, a, a patient uh, that turns out to be positive, that currently, according to this chief, that there's some delay in getting that uh, information to that volunteer rescue squad or whatever? Yeah, so I don't know what's behind that either. I mean, that would be something presumably where the test would have occurred after the person arrived at a healthcare facility, and then the test result would have come subsequent to that. Um, so I'm not, you know, clearly within, since we're on the topic of contact tracing, since that person would have then become a known positive, one of the last interactions that person had before they had the test was with the EMS system. So I'm quite clear that our team would have picked up on that and immediately been in contact with those like EMS who had a uh, acquaintance with that individual. The other part of this, uh, I should just say, is that as any EMS provider will tell you, the, the goal is universal precautions so that every particular patient is considered to possibly be somebody who could have COVID at this uh, time in our existence. So I'm sure they're always thinking along those lines and always erring on the side of this person might have COVID as opposed to, oh, I don't have to worry about this person at all, um, because it is a time when we do advise that. And Governor, just a quick follow. Uh Governor Cuomo announced over the weekend another multi-state uh, group. Uh, this one's for purchasing. Uh, once again, Vermont's not involved, and I'm just wondering why you think Governor Cuomo is ignoring one of the states that abuts uh, his state, and obviously we share Lake Champlain and a lot of other things, and Governor Cuomo apparently. I don't know if he asked you to be in part of this one, but you said earlier the, on the earlier one that Vermont was not part of it. Um, probably a better question for Governor Cuomo, but uh, as you might recall, when they announced the initial Northeast Coalition, we weren't uh, a part of it. Uh, his office did reach out the next day and apologize for that. And uh, we said at that point, we'd love to be uh, part of at least being at the table to understand what they're doing. And because we do share uh, one of our largest borders is with New York. So it does have a direct effect on, on Vermont. So we'd, we'd like to know what's going on if possible. Uh, we haven't been made aware of any uh, subsequent meetings uh, whatsoever. Uh, so I was uh, as surprised as everyone else when I heard uh, that they have this coalition uh, working to, uh, to buy PPEs. So um, I, I think it's a great uh, concept in some respects uh, that they, they would get together. We've tried to, to work with uh, others around New England, uh, whether it be uh, Governor Sununu, uh, Governor Mills, uh, Governor Baker, and talked about uh, some of the, the needs that we have uh, in regards to PPEs and, uh, and that we're also looking into how can we start manufacturing them in our different states and would we uh, be interested in, uh, in, in buying some of these products if they were uh, maybe a little bit more money than what could be uh, bought from uh, uh, outside the country, uh, for instance, uh, over the next uh, couple of years uh, to, to substantiate a, uh, an investment in, in a facility here in Vermont or in New Hampshire or Maine or wherever. Uh, and I think that that's part of our future, something we'll probably learn from this in the postmortem of uh, COVID-19 is um, how do we better take care of ourselves? How do we produce things for ourselves and so that we don't get into the situation we find ourselves in today? Uh, and that would, uh, that would also uh, relate to agriculture. You know, we're going to have to feed ourselves and think about our basic needs. And uh, we have to make sure that we, we have the ability to do that uh, in, if this were ever to come up again. So um, 
but I don't I don't have the answer on that. It's probably an oversight, uh, in that they didn't uh, they didn't include us. But uh, but at this point, we're trying to work with with other states here in our region as well. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Rick Jergens, the Valley News. Yes, uh, regarding testing um, and the, and the uh, and the correctional facilities, um, it looks by my back of the envelope. You've, the the Vermont has tested about a third of the in-state uh, inmates in its uh, prison system, and and also you report that you're retesting folks uh, to to uh, see if they've uh, become negative and been, been cured. Uh, my question is, what what if any lessons does that have? Um, for the general population, that, that's about like, roughly more than 10 times the rate of testing in the general population around the state. Is that something that uh, eventually the state wants to get to, uh, the retesting of folks after they've got positive? Is that something that the state is aiming to implement? This may be uh, Commissioner Le Levine first and then maybe Secretary Smith to talk about the correctional facilities after. Yeah, thanks for those questions. So within the correctional facility, obviously that is an enclosed environment and considered a little bit of a higher risk environment where um, from a public health standpoint, repeated testing is actually the pathway to pursue. Um, initially, the more universal testing in that facility allows us to uh, cohort, as we call it in public health terms, uh, those who have a positive test, those who do not, those who have a likelihood of significant exposure from those who do not, and of course the staff taking care of them as well, just like in a long-term care facility or nursing home uh, would do. Um, with, with the general public, that's the whole principle behind this sort of box it in strategy of testing, isolating, contact tracing and quarantining because you may find there was a high risk setting that was in common for a whole bunch of people and that you can then address uh, very quickly and prevent spread to the general population beyond that arena. Whether it would have been at a work site, whether it would have been at a, uh, a, a business that people frequented in common or a, uh, another recreational setting, whatever, uh, the goal of all of that is to find those places that have more people in common with them that seem to have a high risk for the infection and make sure that you've been able to eradicate it in that arena. With the Vermont population in general, we've tried to make sure that people who have even the slightest symptom, something that may not have been regarded as a substantial cough and shortness of breath and fever, but something much milder, in presentation uh, that those individuals still know that testing is something that they can have accomplished. Um, and we've tried to do that very much. As you know now, we're opening up an entire sector again, the healthcare sector. And that implicates um, doing another kind of testing round that will involve those employees who work in the healthcare workforce. And as you heard in my comments, part of the uh, plan for facilities that want to reopen uh, and deliver health care services again is to have a testing plan in place for the population of uh, employees that they have that have contact with the patients who will be coming there. I don't know if Secretary Smith may have another word or two to add. Just a word or two, um, because uh, I, think, I think Dr. Levine covered it well. If we had the ability, I'd like to test every Vermonter. Um, and I think that's one of the lessons that we've, we've had from this COVID-19 as a country, that we should have the ability to test every Vermonter. What we are doing now in a sort of our second phase, we're on the hunt for this virus now. We've sort of been on the defense with looking at people that have had symptoms uh, before. Now we're on the hunt of going out and looking for this virus in our, in our state. And we're doing it by a lot of asymptomatic testing as we, as we move forward. So I think your, your question is an appropriate question. 
Um, how do we sort of expand from here to the asymptomatic community? And we're doing that in our second phase now. And I know Dr. Levine cringes every time I say the word hunt, but that's what we're doing. We're going out and hunting for this virus and, and using it when we find hot spots through tracing, through testing, to really pounce on uh, trying to contain uh, this virus. Just a, a quick follow-up question to that regarding prison uh, testing. There, there's about 250 inmates in, in Mississippi, and is, is the state taking any measures to uh, monitor what, um, what, the, what the response and the and exposure is for those inmates? We monitor those, uh, that response every day as, as we do with all our correctional facilities. And in fact, we do send people down to Mississippi to make sure that the correct procedures are in place as we move forward. Um, so yes, the answer is yes. Hi, this question is for the governor. Um, election officials have recently expressed some frustration that you and Secretary Condos have not met yet about the mail-in ballot procedures uh, needed for the primary and general election. I was wondering if, if you've met with the secretary about this in the last few days and whether you've reached an agreement on these procedures, given that election officials said it needed to happen by the end of April to get the ballots printed in time. And if you haven't reached an agreement, can you explain why? Um, I have met with the Secretary of State, and um, I don't know if we've come to a conclusion. I, I, we talked about uh, my concerns uh, in, in terms of printing ballots for November. I would only offer that you can't uh, print ballots until you have a primary. And, uh, and they're, you're going to have to wait a, at least a couple of weeks after the primary before you print anything uh, because of the independence and so forth as well. So. Um, I, uh, we did talk about my concerns. Uh, he was going to go back to his team and see if there's anything uh, that they could do <clears throat> to address uh, some of my concerns. And I uh, wanted to reiterate with him, this is not philoso philosophical, it's not political. Uh, it's just uh, from a practical standpoint, I have a number of uh, questions. So we, uh, we did talk and uh, we'll see what happens this week. Okay, and just to just follow up, I mean, you mentioned the, the logistics. Did you have any other concerns? I mean, uh, I haven't heard too much about those. Just curious. Well, we discussed a, a number of things, and, uh, you know, I have a lot of faith in, in their uh, ability to run elections and so forth, so they have that expertise. Um, but, uh, again, from a practical standpoint, I had a few other concerns, and, and uh, he's going to uh, take those back to his team and uh, we'll see what, what they do from there. Okay, can you expand on those concerns or not? I'd, I'd rather not until, you know, I give them an opportunity uh, to come back and see what we can work out. I mean, if we can work this out, great. And uh, because I don't, you know, we, we need to save our energy uh, for fighting this virus uh, and not fighting about uh, other things. But uh, I wouldn't characterize this as a fight either. I mean, it was just, I have concerns about this. I didn't ask to be put in this position uh, between him and elections. Uh, this was something that was done by an amendment at the last minute of the legislation that was passed in the, uh, in the House and Senate. So uh, at this point in time, I'm there and uh, I have concerns. And so uh, I think, uh, again, I'm going to give them a latitude to see if those can be addressed. And if they can, uh, great, and we'll move forward. Thanks. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yep. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Yeah, um, we understand that in a couple of weeks that New Hampshire is going to be starting to open up um, more businesses. I guess on the 11th, they're going to allow beauty salons to operate and with special conditions. If somebody from Vermont goes to New Hampshire for those services, do they have to do anything special when they return? I know a few weeks ago we were talking about quarantine for 14 days. Well, we still have that provision uh, in the stay home, stay safe uh, emergency order. Uh, so that uh, that exists today. Uh, we'll see what happens. Two weeks is, is uh, a long period of time. And we may make some revisions. Uh, we may not. But at this point in time, if, if someone uh, goes uh, to another 
uh, comes in from another state, uh, then they need to quarantine for 14 days. And it's the same true if somebody from Vermont goes to New Hampshire for an hour, comes back to Vermont? Well, there are certain uh, things that can be done. I mean, we had put some exemptions. If you, uh, if you are on the border and you shop at a grocery store in New Hampshire, then you do not have to, uh, to quarantine. So there are certain exemptions. I don't, I don't have it right in front of me, uh, but it's in the, uh, in the executive order. Okay, great, thank you. Lisa Loomis, The Valley Reporter. Hello. Given that the current stay home, stay safe order expires on May 15th, local lodging and event properties are asking us if the quarantine for out-of-state visitors and if the event size rules will continue beyond May 15th. And if so, might they continue beyond June 15th? They're telling us they need this information urgently to manage existing and new reservations. Yeah. Oh, well, again, we're working with the, uh, the associations and so forth, uh, trying to give guidance as we have it. Uh, I think you can expect uh, the uh, state of emergency would probably will be extended in some capacity. The stay home, stay safe uh, provision in the uh, state of emergency uh, may change. Uh, and we've seen those changes over the last two weeks. You'll see some more changes this week. And I would hope if we continue down the, the trending that we're seeing uh, down this path we're going, uh, that uh, we'll see some more lifting of some of those provisions even next week. So. Uh, I understand uh, there's a lot of apprehension, uh, but again, we're guided by the data and the science and, and what's happening in, in other uh, parts of the region. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, they, they're not out of it uh, in New York and, and in um, Massachusetts or Connecticut or Rhode Island or New Jersey. Uh, and uh, those are the folks that want to come to Vermont. So uh, when they're having uh, uh, continue uh, to have the number of deaths that they do, as I said, it was almost uh, 1,000 deaths in Massachusetts alone last week. Uh, that continued, uh, the same trend continued over the weekend. Uh, although decreasing in New York, uh, they still had, uh, I think, about uh, two, at least 2,000 deaths uh, last week alone as well. So uh, we still see uh, high uh, incidence of, of uh, positive testing in that region, uh, which would have a direct effect on us if we opened up lodging and uh, without some guidance and without some provisions for safety, um, we would impact Great. Thank Vermont. You. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Joe Barton Chronicle. I should have stopped earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Barton Chronicle. Joe? All right, we'll move to Colin at VT Digger. Hi. Thanks, as always, for uh, taking all the questions. Um, I had a couple questions about testing. One is uh, for Secretary Smith mentioned that there's a homeless case in Addison County. I was wondering if you could talk about uh, how that's being dealt with. Secretary Smith? That's being dealt with, and I'm going to be a little bit broader in terms of how this is dealt with, so not to make sure that we don't identify any individual uh, as we're, we're talking about that. But that person has been moved to a facility that we have for people that uh, are positive and need um, uh, lodging, for example, uh, that those facilities have been identified before. Um, they're, they're both in Chittenden County, uh, so they have been moved to a Chittenden County uh, facility or lodging facility. Uh, they will be kept there until their 14 days or thereabouts has been uh, determined that they are, they are okay to leave that facility. And then the tracing of any person that's been in contact with that person will begin, has begun, my understanding as of a morning uh, call has begun to trace uh, who that person has contacted and if needed um, more testing because of that uh, tracing 
uh, uh, tracing exercise that we do. But uh, testing and tracing go hand in hand. I will. I, I expect there will probably be more testing and tracing because of this uh, this incident. But that's that's all I can say at, uh, about it at this point. Was this person living in some facility with a number of other people? Why is there some belief that this may be some sort of spreading situation? We take every case as a spreading um, case. Every single case we take uh, that a person has a, a positive test, we take as a, a, a spreading uh, incident. So we will do the the same thing that we do normally will tr trace if this this person happened to be in a in some sort of a, a maybe possible congregate setting we're tracing that right now to make sure that it has not spread into that uh, into any other thing but right now uh, we have one positive case and we're looking at uh, where we go from here thanks I think that question may have been worded poorly but you're answer came up in response to a question about these facility type of situations. Um, and I then just, one other question. Could I just add yeah, one, one line to that? Just again to expand on contact tracing and where our vision is. Um, obviously everybody who becomes a case acquired their viral infection from somewhere. And tradition is that we would look 48 hours prior to the time they became positive or symptomatic to figure out where that may have happened. The newer version of that that's in part of our enhanced contact tracing that's beginning now is that we would actually go back 14 days because we would want to give a full incubation period. Admittedly, most people become symptomatic on day five or day six, but we always go to day 14 because that's the within the realm of possibility of when someone might develop symptoms from an exposure. So this individual, it won't just matter where they were in the last couple of days, it will matter where they were in the last couple of weeks. And Colin, I think I just heard you say, um, I just wanted to provide the context. The, the example they gave of the homeless situation was in response to a question about where contract tracing had been used, not necessarily at a facility. So I thought that's what I just heard you say. Uh, yeah, I think that I worded the question poorly, but that's, that's understood. Um, and then a question for either Secretary Smith or Dr. Levine about, we've heard that false negatives uh, may be sort of complicating uh, efforts to relocate prisoners and that kind of thing. I was wondering if you could talk about sort of how the state is grappling with false negatives and false positives on some of the screening that it's doing to release people from some of the restricted settings? Sure. So the, one of the byproducts of the rapidity with which the COVID-19 pandemic has occurred is that the FDA has approved a whole slew of tests for the test that we call PCR, where you can detect the actual presence of virus in the nasal or oral secretions. We know that the tests can find low levels of virus. However, these tests are so new that we don't really know in the typical clinical setting what these terms that we call sensitivity and specificity are for the virus. How likely is this test to actually find virus in somebody who has the symptoms of this disease or the opposite? So, the estimates that are being thrown around now, and these are estimates because this has not been clearly worked out anywhere in the country, is maybe 5% to 20% false negative rate, meaning you won't find the virus even in somebody who clinically seems to have all the right picture, all the right exposures, all the right symptoms, etc. The opposite of that false positive um, is a little less worked out and probably is not as significant as the false negative. What you're referring to, um, and I think your question though, is that people can actually remain positive on their testing for a longer period than you would imagine. So they come down with symptoms, they have a positive test, seven to ten days later, they're fine and raring to go, uh, and if you retest them, you actually find out that they still have a positive test. 
We wouldn't call that a false positive test because we already knew that they had the disease and they had a true positive early on. It's just that they didn't lose that positivity as quickly as you might have thought they would have considering the fact that they feel well. And because that happens actually fairly frequently, the CDC is now recommending another um, process to go through to determine if someone is eligible to go back to work and get out of isolation. Because theoretically, you might keep them in isolation for two or three weeks if you demand a negative test be their ticket out. And so now the CDC is saying, we're going to allow people to basically have no symptoms uh, for the last three days, meaning their temperature is fine, the other symptoms they presented with are fine, and if they are greater than seven days from the time of onset of their illness and they're completely free for those three days, they can go back to work, go back uh, outside their home, whatever, um, and use a non-test protocol, if you will, to return back. So these are not false positive results. These are just persistently positive results. Hope that was clear. Thank you very much. Neil, the Vermont Standard. Hello. Um, my question is about um, domestic violence. Um, what is being done financially to help domestic violence agencies that are witnessing upticks in calls and higher levels of, volume, of, of violence? And um, how are you addressing um, the lack of reporting for uh, child abuse and sexual assault. I'll let uh, Secretary Smith start, and uh, Commissioner Sherling uh, might want to answer part of that as well. Thanks, Neil, for the question. Um, first, I want to say that you know during this COVID-19, I've been really proud of the agency's response to sort of keep the infrastructure in place and operational operationalized um, and, and throughout state government, by the way, operationalized to uh, respond to child abuse or domestic uh, abuse, as you, you said. We've kept the infrastructure in place. We've kept operationalized as we have, uh, ha have dealt with this crisis, not to take our eye off the ball. With uh, one of the things that you have brought up, and I'll let Commissioner Sherling um, discuss uh, the, the, sort of the issue of uh, domestic abuse. I'll, I'll start with child abuse. Uh, consistent with other states, our Department of Child and Families has seen a substantial decrease in the number of child abuse uh, reports uh, during this crisis. Um, we've tried to start a, to delve into it, and the reasons are a little bit complicated, but in large part can be attributed to children being less visible um, during uh, this time of the crisis. Um, for example, we don't have uh, children going to school. We don't have uh, children at their health care providers, although we're doing something about that starting today with opening up sort of the clinics and health care providers. So it, it has a lot to do with that. Just to give you some statistics on child abuse, from March 15th to April 15th, 2019, there were 432 accepted reports on maltreatment allegations with children. During that same period in 2020, uh, that number has dropped to 127. I think what is important, and the message I want to say from your question, um, although it doesn't precisely hit your question, but the message I want to say is if you see child abuse, please call and report any suspected uh, child abuse. You may not have the whole picture, but you, if you suspect something, uh, please call. It might be a bit of information needed to accept a report and start the investigation. We'll be doing some PSAs on this as well with child abuse and domestic abuse. Um, the child abuse hotline, if, hotline for those who uh, may not know is 
5285. This is important. The, to answer your question, the numbers are down, uh, as I've said, uh, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So we're asking people to report. Uh, Commissioner Sherling, do you have anything to add there? Yes, uh, good afternoon. Thanks for the question. Uh, you have correctly identified that uh, the calls regarding domestic violence, family disturbances, things of that nature are up. Calls to hotlines statewide are up. Uh, our work together with uh, the network of uh, advocacy agencies continues. Uh, we're in the midst of co-authoring a grant to uh, sustain additional funding. Um, the network is doing renewed communications and release that, uh, news releases uh, related to this as well. Um, domestic and sexual violence advocacy sessions, uh, group sessions continue remotely. The shelters are still operating. Uh, and the network agencies are providing a variety of additional supports to survivors uh, and victims under the circumstances ranging from diapers and food um, to uh, face masks and, and things that are personally uh, protective uh, as well. Um, so a variety of work continues. Uh, this challenge uh, remains unabated uh, under the circumstances. Okay, thank you. All right, Sean, the Chester Telegraph. Thank you. Uh, we continue to see substantial numbers of people going without masks in public buildings. Last week you said that education was the key to compliance, and we're wondering what efforts are being made by the state to educate the public, including people coming into the resort areas in southern Vermont from out of state and not quarantining. And I'll have a follow-up. Well, very difficult uh, to manage. Obviously, we've had uh, signs up as they enter the state. Uh, we've tried to communicate that through every single press conference we've had uh, that uh, you need to quarantine when you come into the state. Um, in terms of, uh, of uh, those in your region, um, we, would, uh, we would offer that we, we would we'd like to find uh, a way, uh, hopefully in your publication, uh, that you will reiterate uh, what our what our guidelines are uh, the the, uh, the stay at home the stay safe uh, order as well as the emergency order uh, has in place uh, guidelines uh, that you must you must quarantine when you come into the state uh, if there's a if there's a an abuse of that I believe there is something uh, on the public safety uh, and possibly on the ACCD uh, website uh, that where you could uh, where you could make that claim uh, and uh, so that we could follow up. Um, a, a reader has made the analogy that the, of the state banning smoking in public spaces to reduce the health consequences of secondhand smoke. How would mandating facial coverage uh, be to prevent disease be any different from that? Well, again, I, you know, this takes some time. Um, this has uh, just started over the last few months. Uh, I think uh, secondhand smoke uh, took years to put into, into place. Uh, to use the uh, comparison, I don't think is apples to apples. Uh, hopefully, uh, again, uh, from, uh, I'm gonna ask Commissioner Levine to, to, uh, to also um, uh, give his views on this. Um, but, uh, you know, anecdotally, we're seeing uh, more compliance. Uh, I've seen it uh, more in our region. I'm not sure why it isn't in your region, uh, but uh, but anything we can do to promote that uh, would be uh, a positive. And uh, and I would advocate that your publication, if you could, uh, to make this a, a highlight uh, and uh, to make sure that we do all we can uh, to protect each other. Commissioner Levine. I feel compelled to, again, offer the results of my informal weekend survey. Um, this past weekend, I would say 90%, and the two, one large box and one supermarket settings that I entered, I did enter to buy something, not just to do my survey, uh, just to keep the record clear. Uh, and as what the governor's been alluding to, we're really trying to uh, create a, a norm, a cultural norm, and cultural norms generally come through uh, people understanding and being educated 
uh, some element of peer pressure, some element of businesses uh, saying, like with smoking, you can't enter if you're smoking. Uh, some are saying you can't enter if you're not facially covering. Uh, so all of these things, I think, will build up to a level that uh, it will be the exception and not the rule that someone is seen entering one of these places. The uh, healthcare sector opening that we just talked about today had built in uh, facial covering. And I would dare say that um, they will probably provide it if someone isn't wearing it, but at the same time, they would not allow anyone to deviate from that practice norm there. Uh, but it's really trying to uh, evolve our culture. And if you think about in a very short number of weeks, how many new things are now cultural norms that we never would have imagined before COVID. Um, the fact is, we've shown that we're all capable of achieving these things. Do we want these things for the rest of our life? Probably not, but at the same time, when they're important, we need to uh, begin to learn how to adhere to them and make them seem like second nature and not something that's unique and special for this time period. Thank you. All right, Alex, journal opinion. Alex, in the journal opinion. Hi, uh, follow-up question to um, the one regarding barbershops and salons earlier. Uh, is it unlikely that the state will consider uh, close contact business reopenings before the expiration of the current stay home order? I would just say that uh, everything's on the table at this point. Uh, we're trying to consider what would be next steps and, uh, and I, I can't really answer that, although uh, we're only about 10 days away from the uh, stay home order um, expiring. So uh, as I said before, uh, they will, uh, you should be prepared. Uh, the state of emergency will continue in some capacity, uh, but there will be uh, changes along the way, uh, even up to that point and, uh, and after as well, as we watch the data, watch the science, listen to the experts, listen to our restart team on what's most appropriate to open in a safe manner, we'll do so. Thank you. Avery, WCAX. You sound like you're from another planet, Avery. Um, maybe. Uh, can you hear me now? Let we me. can. We can. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so, colleges across the state, including UVM and now uh, the Vermont State College System, say they plan to open their campuses in the fall. Has the state given any higher ed institutions guidance on what kind of opening that could look like, whether students would be in dorms, um, what type of classrooms that would be, things like that? I, I, I'm not sure at this point uh, we, whether we've given any informal guidance, uh, certainly not any formal guidance. Uh, I will say that uh, with, the, with the news from UVM and other institutions, uh, they have all, all given the caveat uh, that it depends on on what the state is doing at that point in time. So um, I applaud them for planning ahead uh, because they need to, um, but, uh, but at the same time, alluding to the fact that uh, our, state, our state of emergency may not be over either. Uh, so uh, again, we're trying to uh, do all we can at this point in time with the, with the emergency in place and, uh, and trying to open up businesses as we can uh, every week if the, uh, if the trending continues. And uh, hopefully uh, they will uh, get to open uh, in, the, uh, in the fall as, uh, as they uh, are planning. Is that type of guidance something the state would give? Yes, I, I would say that every sector uh, is, is, we're working with the institutions, uh, different sectors, uh, trying to, like we, as we did uh, with the farmers markets, for instance, as we did with the manufacturers, as we did with the contractors. Uh, we're trying to work with every single sector to find guidelines that are uh, amenable to both and that, so they can put those into place and then adhere to them. It's not a top-down approach. Uh, we're trying to work with them. So the same would hold true uh, for higher institutions. 
All right, thank you. Greg, the County Courier. Hi, Governor. Um, I'd like to uh, just bring up the topic of uh, garden centers. Uh, I noticed over the weekend that there are many garden centers that because of the the 10 person rule in the garden center there's a, a an extremely long line outside garden centers uh people although they try to adhere to the, the six foot rule uh really it, it may be an un unintended consequence of this 10 person uh rule of thumb that we're congregating now outside in greater numbers um, I'm wondering if you would consider, you know, changing that uh, to, to better suit this unintended consequence. I, I would advocate that uh, maybe the further guidance might be necessary because as I witnessed myself with the farmers markets, uh, they were, uh, they had a line too, uh, waiting to go in uh, to uh, the farmers markets, uh, but they were distancing themselves. They all had masks on, uh, they were uh, pre-ordering. Uh, they were taking a lot of steps uh, to keep everyone safe. So uh, they had a long line, but they were um, more than six feet apart, uh, as I saw. So I think uh, it can be done. Uh, I think it takes creativity. I think it takes discipline. Uh, and if further guidance is needed, I, I believe we gave that guidance, but if there's further guidance that's needed uh, to keep everyone safe and adhere to the 10-person uh, limit, uh, we'll give it. I guess, I guess I'm wondering if that 10 person limit was lifted, would people get in and out of the garden center quicker, uh, have less contact with other people and be able to get their their products and, and move on with less, less contact uh, in the long run? Well, again, I, I would think in the future, uh, we're, we're hopeful that we can lift all of that uh, and go back to some sort of normalcy uh, will, while practicing uh, some of the uh, self-administered social separation as well as uh, masking and so forth so uh, at this point in time um, I'm not prepared to to say that we're going to lift that uh, because I, I think the team has done a pretty good job in trying to put through guidelines that are uh, that uh, do adhere to both the 10 person mass ga gathering limit uh, as well as uh, in one one space uh, but also keeping keeping others safe so uh, I wouldn't see that we'd be lifting that uh, in the next uh, week or so, but but uh, who knows? Based on again the data and the science and everything that we're doing, uh, and uh, trying to determine other safe ways of opening other businesses as well, I think that uh, we can use uh, use the farmers market again as a model for how it can be done because I saw it and, and they were doing it uh, and and keeping everyone safe at the same time. Thanks, Governor. Thanks for your time. Michelle Monroe, St. Albans Messenger. Hello, Governor. Um, we've been getting some questions from folks who want us to ask you um, things that people would like to know about. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Michelle? Most of the questions we've been getting is focused on unemployment, which were addressed at the beginning of the conference. And so, but one of the questions was about um, summer camps and if there was any chance that those might open, especially because they, they offer an, an opportunity for childcare. So I was just wondering how much your restart committee has taken a look at that. Yeah, they are actively uh, pursuing that and working on that as we speak. So I would expect, uh, in the next week or so that we would have some guidance put forward on that uh, that initiative i know it's an, an issue that we okay. everyone is asking about and uh, we're going to we're going to act on something great thank you governor thank you joel burlington free press uh hello uh governor and, and gang um i'm I'm, this may be a question for Commissioner Sterling. Um, I've read elsewhere that uh, public safety organizations are relying more on, on drones to keep an eye on 
congregations of people and, and monitoring safety. And I was wondering to what extent um, Vermont's Department of Public Safety is either using drones or, or advising police departments in the use of drones to uh, both monitor safe practices and preserve folks' privacy? I think that's a great question for Commissioner Sherling. Good afternoon, Joel. Thanks for the question. Uh, we are not using unmanned aerial vehicles uh, for the COVID response. We do have a fleet of them. Uh, they're used for crime scene and accident reconstruction uh, and things of that nature, but they haven't been deployed for this. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Liam, VPR. Hi. Um, I was wondering, Governor and Dr. Levine, as we start to slowly reopen the economy and we start to see cases increase, just what is the threshold that, that you'll be looking at for like an, a, an acceptable growth? Um, and, and what would the threshold be that you would institute um, more restrictive measures again if we, if we reach that point? Um, I'll let uh, Commissioner Levine uh, weigh in as well. But uh, as you might recall from the very beginning, uh, what we were trying to do was to mitigate the number of positive cases and to mitigate this so that we didn't have uh, an exceedance of our healthcare capacity. Uh, that's that's our overall uh, goal is to make sure that we are able to take care of uh, people as they uh, come are in contact and, and come down with the virus. Uh, so uh, that remains uh, our goal, my goal, uh, in trying to keep people safe. Uh, whether there's an acceptable amount is uh, is really difficult to answer, but I'll I'll let Dr. Levine try to answer that. That is, that is a very challenging question, and it illustrates the concept of we're always trying to look into the future on a daily basis with a virus that can take up to two weeks to show the results of its infecting people. And so you need to begin to start looking at trend data. And the trend data, you know, right now we're in a pretty much of a flattening of the curve, as we called it, and a plateauing. But the trend data would obviously be things like the percent of our, all of our tests that are done that are positive, the rate of growth of uh, new infections in terms of the incidence rate of infections. And we would begin to also begin to look at impact on the healthcare system, uh, hospitalization rate for people with uh, presumptive diagnosis or true test positive diagnosis of COVID, uh, need for ICUs, et cetera. So all of those metrics, if you will, are feeding into the same equation that we did way back in the beginning. Uh, but we need to try to be very nimble and be way ahead of the curve because you don't want to discover on day 14 what you should have done on day four or five. And I think we were very adept at doing that early on in this and uh, had some success to get to where we are now, obviously. Um, but that's what we'll be trending and watching very closely. We continue to work with all of our uh, modeling experts as well. And sometimes the modeling, which is based on the kinds of metrics I mentioned, uh, will begin to show trends as well. So every day of the week, we look at all of the same data all the time. So my hope is that we will be able to pick up uh, an adverse trend that would require an intervention uh, early enough in the case that uh, things would not have gotten out of hand. I do think that the enhanced testing and the enhanced contact tracing are going to play a big role in that um, because of the fact that they go back so far in time, they involve so much more additional testing, they'll even be testing performed of those who uh, have had a contact trace uh, positive result from the interviewing, so that um, we'll have a lot more data this time around than any state would have had in the early go around. Does that uh, answer your question? Yeah, um, that, that does answer some of it. I mean, are, 
would you be able to, can you share a, a specific, I know there's a lot of factors that you're looking at, you listed off a number, but there are, is there a one or two kind of specific thresholds, like the number of percent of positives of total number of cases that, that you kind of have in your head as like the number or the point where you'd start to be getting concerned? Is there a specific number there? Yeah, so there's not necessarily a specific number, and it really is a, a, a synthesis, an analysis of all the data and a synthesis of all the data streams. You know, clearly now we're in the percent positive uh, tests, we're in the low single digits percent. Uh, we clearly want to be below 10 percent uh, throughout the time period. Uh, would 10% cause a change? Not necessarily, depending on how everything else looked, but that would be a trend we'd want to watch very closely. You know, the places that are having the, the peak of their outbreaks now are over 30% of their tests are positive. Obviously, we don't want to get there overnight, and we want to know we were headed there early on. But that doesn't mean that if we got to 11%, it would be time to change everything. We'd have to integrate that with all the other factors as well. Right. Um, and, and then just as you get gather more data from this enhanced testing and contact tracing, I, I know, um, Governor, in, the, in previous press conferences, you said you wouldn't want to selectively reopen regions um, of the state. But as you can more identify areas where that might have outbreaks or, as uh, Secretary Smith said, hot spots, is that a, something you'd be considering, uh, like restricting certain areas of the state um, while letting others remain open? Well, again, uh, my preference would be uh, to do this as one state rather than as uh, diff putting, pitting one region against another, pitting one town against another. It gets very difficult, uh, as you might imagine, if, uh, if you said uh, closing off all of Chittenden County, for instance, uh, and letting the rest of the uh, state open up. I I'm not sure that that would be fair to those uh, in the outlying areas that may have uh, no cases within their towns uh, and uh, in Chittenden County. So it, it becomes problematic to try and do that. Again, we're, we're, we think uh, we have a good tracing and testing program in place uh, that we're going to build upon. Uh, we think that we've done things right. Uh, we've asked for monitors to do the right thing, stay home, stay safe. Uh, we're seeing a change in behavior in terms of uh, masking. We're as we're opening businesses, we're, we're asking uh, those uh, employees to wear masks as well. I think that uh, everything that we're doing is moving us in the right direction. So I would rather not talk about retreating. I would rather talk about how do we manage this uh, so that we can get back to some sort of normal and we can open up more businesses. So uh, again, um, I, I would rather look at this as uh, the glass being half full and moving forward in a, a very slow, methodical way so that we don't have to have these conversations uh, that you're, uh, you're alluding to. Thanks, Governor. Patricia Bennington-Banner. Hello, can you hear me? We can. All righty, um, this would be a question uh, probably for the governor. I'm wondering, uh, the press release from Rebecca Kelly uh, referencing this reopening of some elective procedures, uh, clinic visits that you mentioned earlier. In the guidance in that press release regarding the steps that should be taken, it says these steps should be taken. It, does, it doesn't say they have to be. So I'm wondering, the, require, the things listed in the press release and, and that Dr. Levine mentioned, like um, setting up testing protocols, separating chairs, testing um, people that would come in contact with patients, things like that. Are they really, are they recommendations or are they requirements? Um, I'm going to, uh, that may be a great question for me, but I'm going to turn it over to Commissioner Levine. Uh. Yeah, they, they are expectations. Conditions uh, for reopening, if you will. So, um, so the I don't know if you've, if you've seen the release that the Rebecca sent out. I I don't want to read them, of course, because it's a very long um, list. But all the things that that's listed in that release regarding outpatient clinic visits and diagnostic imaging and outpatient surgeries, screening, testing, disinfecting, PPE, all that those those are requirements. All of them. Yes, yes. For instance, um, with PPE. 
if they, if they cannot uh, have the supply that they need at any given time uh, and maintain that supply, uh, they would not be able to, uh, to operate because of the PPE requirements of some of the interactions. And are, is there an enforcement mechanism here in terms of um, compliance with these these regulations? Is it just you know taken that that they will in fact do this? Let's use the, this is Mike Smith. Let's use the PPE for example. We we expect them to self-govern their PPE use, usage. They will not be able to access the state supplies of PPE, nor will they be able to sort of uh, use other state facilities for PPE. So they're going to be have to self-regulate uh, their own PPE. These are requirements. You've got to test. Uh, individuals that are coming in that have airway procedures, for example, or management of airway procedures, you've got to screen those uh, patients before they come in. Uh, you have to have a sufficient PPE. There is no equivocation on what is required here, both for the clinic and for the uh, outpatient uh, surgical procedures as well. So I, I, I'm, I, I'm struggling a little bit. Those are requirements. In terms of enforcement, this has been done with the um, collaboration of just about every medical uh, society and association that you can find. Um, I think there's going to be self-regulation, but if we hear of somebody not doing it, the executive order gives the authority to the commissioner of, of health in order to intervene and, and, uh, and he has enforcement capabilities and enforce if he has to. All right, thank you. Guy Page. Governor, uh, I've wondered, uh, for you as, not as governor, but as a citizen, what's been the hardest thing for you to do during this state of emergency? Uh, and also, has any particular leader inspired you especially at this time? Um, <laughs> tough to, to answer in some respects. I think every decision that I've had to make, uh, every major decision has been the toughest one. Uh, they don't seem to get any easier, and uh, I would say uh, the toughest, the toughest decisions, may be yet to come uh, in trying to open some of the the businesses and entities and so forth, and doing it in a safe manner, knowing everyone is, is uh, anxious uh, to go back to normalcy, and uh, what I'm trying to do is make sure that we're we're working together uh, to make sh uh, to, um, to uh, to keep the public safety in mind uh, and not do any harm to anyone. So uh, probably the, the most difficult decision I've had to make uh, is the last one uh, because they've all been they've all been difficult. Um, in terms of uh, being inspired, I'm I'm inspired by by many, uh, but I'm not sure that anyone who has gone through what we're going through at this point in time, I, I think uh, will. We'll see over time uh, who does the right thing and who doesn't. We need to check our egos uh, in this uh, in this case. We're all in this together. I thought uh, uh, President Bush uh, put out a message over the weekend that was uh, well received from my standpoint. Uh, that this isn't a time for partisanship. This is a time for us uh, to work together. And uh, and I think that uh, history will be the judge in, in who does that and who doesn't. And if we check our egos at the door and we uh, we do the right thing. And we, uh, we learn from this uh, and admit that maybe some of the things we did weren't right uh, or some of the things we did do were right, uh, that we learn together on how to prepare for this in the future. I guess I was just wondering if Phil Scott, as private citizen, uh, you, you've got to go by the rules, too. Uh, what's just as a in your in your private life, uh, what's what's sort of the hardest thing for you about all of this? I'm not sure I have much of a private life uh, these days, uh, Guy. I, I, you know, I'm I'm still working seven days a week, uh, and uh, I did uh, I did manage to work half a day and got off at uh, three o'clock on 
both Saturday and Sunday uh, this week. But then I went back home and, and just uh, read my weekly reports and, and did some other, other work. So um, there's not much of a, a private life at this point, um, but, uh, but I'm looking forward to one just like everyone else when we get back to normal. Uh, but until we do, I'll continue to work as diligently as I can uh, to, for the public safety of Vermont and to try and get the economy open back up uh, so that we can get back to, uh, again, uh, this new normal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, that's it. Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much for tuning in. We'll see you on Wednesday.